So uh, uh, thank you to everyone for coming. It's great to see interest in this topic in Congress. I think it's one of these issues that's going to become a hot button, specifically around the control and use of data itself. Uh, if you're not watching what's happening in the broader scope of the economy around this, uh, I think it is one of the, the central tech policy issues. Um, so if you want to get smart, uh, I'm, I'm glad to see you're making use of these forums. Uh, the Internet Caucus has been one of the places to have these discussions that, since I moved to D.C. in 2009. Uh, where people are digging in a bit deeper, and I'm really grateful that they've invited me to here to be part of the conversation as opposed to tapping away in the sidelines because I get to ask fun questions. And uh, Spencer uh, is the CEO of Zillow. As you know, he's now a Harvard grad, uh, not a dropout. And uh, if you want to get the rest of his bio, it's on these sheets. So I won't read the whole thing. We can get right to it. Um, but uh, it is worth noting that you were one of the uh, dot-com boom uh, uh, winners. You, uh, <laughs> you uh, co-founded Hotwire and sold to Expedia back in the day. Um, so uh, let's go start with that. Um, you know, if you think about uh, Hotwire and what Expedia did earlier on, they were giving consumers a better way, an easier way to search for travel options. Um, how come Zillow didn't get invented back in the 1990s? <laughs> what changed? Um, well, y y it's, it's so quaint to even think of life before online travel agencies, but there was a time, you can remember it, when you'd be on the phone with a travel agent and, and you'd say, you know, I want to fly from D.C. to L.A., and you could hear them typing, right? And you just want to jump through the phone and see what computer screen are you looking at and why can't I have access to that database? And that's what Expedia did. That's what Hotwire did. It turned the screen around so the consumers had access to the same database. When, I, when we sold Hotwire to Expedia in 2003, I moved up to Seattle and I was at Expedia. And after about a year there, um, the team from Expedia started thinking about other verticals that hadn't yet been revolutionized by the internet. And um, we quickly looked at real estate and said, well, there's this huge sector of the economy that there was no leading company with a consumer orientation. So to answer your question very specifically as to why nobody did it, why didn't Zillow happen 10 years earlier, um, the biggest reason was the category leader at the time was created by the industry and for the industry, and it didn't have a consumer orientation. It basically existed to help the industry. It didn't exist to help the consumer. Talking the real estate industry here. The real estate industry, exactly. The professional, the practitioners. Mm -hmm. And so we, we approached the, the, the problem slightly differently. We, we tried to create a media company that empowered consumers with access to information. And so a good strategic analog isn't even really Expedia because Expedia is in the transaction, right? I mean, you buy travel from Expedia. You, you can't buy a house from Zillow. You can yes. get a lot of information. Well, I don't think you'll ever be able to buy a house truly online because it's such an infrequent, complex, expensive transaction that- Whereas health insurance, we're good to go. <laughs> um, we can go there if you want, but, um, but, but, but health care, which is actually where I was going to go, health information is sort of similar. So WebMD is a pretty good strategic analog for what we're doing at Zillow. So you go to WebMD or Yahoo Health or wherever, and you read articles about your condition, and you, you educate yourself, and you learn about medications, and you learn about side effects. And, you know, it used to be before the Internet that only the doctor had that information. The, the, when they graduate from med school, they get kind of three books, the book of all the diseases, the book of all the meds, and the books of all the side effects. And unless you saw a doctor, you, you couldn't access that database. And now, of course, that's the internet. I mean, all that is available online. And, and so that's what we tried to do at Zillow. We tried to give, to, to remedy the information asymmetry that always existed in the real estate industry, where only the practitioner had the data. So that's a good place to start, the data. Yeah. Um, where are you pulling data from, and how does this relate to this broader idea of open data, or in this case, open government data, which is to say data that's free, data that's legally free to use, and data that's in a machine-readable format? That's the basic way you define open data in a neutral sense. It could be from private industry, it could be from academia, or from government. We buy it. It's not free for us. Um, we buy, all, we spend millions of dollars a year buying data um, on property transactions. And so there are companies, From whom? Um, I think I'm not allowed to say technically, but there are, there are big companies, big publicly traded companies, uh, um, that send people in to county courthouses, get property records, fax them offshore, they get manually keyed in, they bring them back to the US and they sell them to title insurance companies, to direct mail companies. I mean, have you ever wondered why when you move, into your new house, you get all sorts of mail from credit card companies and other other you know home improvement companies, 
the, the reason is all those companies buy this data from companies that buy title that, that buy property record data. And so, um, so ultimately, the source is the county. I wish we could get it for free from the counties electronically. That would be beautiful. Instead, we pay millions of dollars a year to these intermediaries that are sending people in to the counties to collect it and then, and then repackage it to people like us. So the, the, the transaction data, what people paid for their home, the property attributes, bedrooms, bathrooms, square footage, roof type, et cetera, um, the tax assessment and taxes paid, all that starts at the county but it goes through different you know, kind of a bowl of spaghetti of intermediaries and then it gets sold to companies like us. We then put it online for free and we let people change it. And so about 50 million of the homes in the United States now, the, well, there are 110 million homes in the U.S. and 110 million property records on Zillow. So everyone's home has a, has a page on Zillow. And about and nearly half of them have actually had some aspect of that home edited or changed over the last eight years by the owner or the owner's representative, maybe the square footage, maybe what the last sale record was. So it's the way we think of it, as much as Wikipedia is a living database of all the world's knowledge on, on people, for example, you probably have a Wikipedia page, and people can Not go yet, edit it. No, maybe today. We can make news today, and then maybe you'll, you'll get a Wikipedia page. Um, <laughs> but people can then edit it, and um, that's something similar with Zillow. So you can claim your home on Zillow, you or as the owner or you or the owner, the agent as your representative, and they can edit property attributes on Zillow. Um, so we're we're a um, you know a huge proponent of and customer of open data around property records, but it's not just property records. There's lots of other data that we use. Um, You're paying for that we yeah. pay for yeah. some of which, some of which we get for free from the government. So for example, um, when when our economics team. Um, uh, forecasts what will happen to home values 12 years from now. Uh, sorry, 12 months from now. I wish we knew what was going to happen 12 years from now. But 12 months from now, um, we're using inputs from, you know, Fed and HUD and OFEO and um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics and, and others to go into our models. So we, we do use a lot of free government data, to um, which, which you as a consumer would see on the website in different ways. You, for example, when you look up your home on Zillow, you see this estimate and you see the um, the median's estimate in your neighborhood, your city, your state, your county, and then we do estimate forecasting at those levels. And now we also do estimate forecasting at the property level, so actually tell you what we think your house will be worth a year from now. Um, and all of that is informed by by open data that we get from from the government, which helps uh, go into our models. So the uh, open data that's available to you, to your competitors, to the public. Mm -hmm. um, the data you're buying, um, that's more of the competitive differentiator in terms of how someone else entering the market would have to gear up to be able to afford that. Yes, in, in, and it's, you know, it's not, it's not prohibitively expensive. Um, I mean, it is for a consumer. For a company, it's not prohibitively expensive. Uh, but it is expensive. The hard part, though, isn't, isn't even really procuring the data. It's actually cleaning the data. Because it, it comes in, um, even from these third parties whose sort of value proposition to their customers is that it's, it's clean. It, it's still not. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, as an example, um, we'll get... Um, mismatch property records all the time where uh, you know it'll say one two three main street is is what we think the the parcel is and in the the data that comes to us it'll be one two three main you know st period and that's an e easy example because we're able to match those two parcels but um, there are a lot of more complex examples where we don't properly match the parcel we create a new property record and then there are two duplicate properties for the same home and then we have to sort of later merge them and so it's, it's, it's expensive, but not prohibitively expensive to procure the data. It's really complex to actually make it usable for the consumer. Yep. Well, uh, from the media side, I can tell you that the, the data journalists of the world, and they do exist, hundreds of them, maybe not thousands quite yet, have the same kind of headache. Right. They look at the same kinds of government records, other records, and have to kind of go through them and really normalize them, figure mm -hmm. out what's real and what's not. Um, how many people do you have dedicated to doing this kind of washing, rinsing, oh, structuring, et cetera? How much um, can you automate it? I mean, what's, what's the... Uh, at least 50 in, in some form or another involved in, in, in this. I mean, we have almost 1,000 employees, uh, but probably four, 400 or so are involved in the product in some form or another. But that's, that's not just data. It's, 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 it's a lot of different things. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's expensive and it's complex. Um, uh, the different... Um, there are some success stories here around making data available to, to companies and to, to innovation. I mean, for example, now 
crime data is pretty readily available from the FBI and from a lot of city police departments and some places like this, like San Francisco, for example, put, put it put online. That into listings, right? Um, into the maps around us. We, so uh, we, we, we haven't fully put it into the, into the product. We've done a lot of analysis and sort of produced research about it and it impact, evaluated how it impacts home values. We haven't actually gotten around to yet putting it on, on the site, but we will. Okay. Um, um, but, uh, you know, that's not available in a standardized form because, of course, you have different jurisdictions that map, you know, different crimes in different ways. And this is one of the things that's kept us from putting it into the product because we approach everything from an, a, a national level. With, we have 75 million people that use Zillow every month nationwide. We're the biggest real estate site. And so we try to solve problems in scalable ways. I mean, if we were just a San Francisco real estate site, it would be really easy. You just put in the San Francisco Police Department's data up on the site, no problem. But I'm not sure that's that easy, but you know, <laughs> it sounds good. Uh, it's easier than trying to do it nationwide. Okay. Um, and, and especially when you get conflicting or, or duplicative data from, say, a city, a state, a county, and the FBI, just as an example, and how do you, you, know, how do you deal with situations like that? Um, now, uh, New York's a pretty big and pretty hot real estate market. Very. Um, but uh, their uh, police department isn't quite as forthcoming with data as a lot of people would like to see. They've got uh, a map you can go to, but the underlying data isn't very accessible. Um, are you able to make uh, an economic or consumer-focused argument to you know, de Blasio's office about making that more machine-readable? Is, yeah. is that a conversation that's even uh, taking place? Yeah, you know, the, the objection, um, at least at the local level, it, it's... It's not. It's usually not philosophical, uh, especially around crime data, because I think most people find that it's there's, there's public benefit for people being able to have access to that. It's kind of. It's sort of. To me, it's almost a moral issue. It's like if it's my if it's my community and I pay taxes in that community, I ought to be able to know what is happening in that community. Um, uh, the objection, especially at the local level, when there is objection, is usually around budget and complexity and prioritization. It's not really philosophical. I, in that particular instance, I don't know. I, I have. I don't know if if they have some political objection or some, uh, maybe, you know, maybe, 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 I mean, he's concerned about a lot of things that the prior administration wasn't concerned about. And so maybe there, maybe there's more going on there. I don't know. I, I would need to let them speak for themselves. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you I, know something. Here's, here's how to get your Wikipedia page, you know, <laughs> blasts de Blasio at, you know, well, I've, I've, already, I've already gone on the record, to, uh, you know, over at, at the Columbia blog saying that uh, putting a map up isn't enough. The underlying data needs to be right. there. The, the additional step, though, and the one that's maybe more controversial, is that the algorithms they're using for predictive policing will also need to go there. Well, that's, well, that, and that, that's really the next horizon yeah. for a lot of the space. If you're watching how data is being used, understanding the interpretations, the analytics that are being applied to it to get to the end result that's being shown to the consumer, or the government official, or anyone else. If you've ever come across the idea of redlining, think about the same process except being used with much more personalization. Well, it, I mean, just to give you a, a private sector example of where that works really well, very controversial company, Uber. Um, no, they're not. It's a total, uh, nothing at all. Uh, well, but they use data in this way mm -hmm. to great consumer benefit. I mean, the, 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 the beauty of the Uber model is that the wait times are really short because they predict where demand will come from, and so they actually tell the cars where to be, and um, and a lot of technology goes into that, yeah. and I, I, you know, gosh, if we could predict where crime was going to be and we could put the police where they need to be, that would be interesting. Well, they are. I mean, that, yeah. like this is this is happening. Uh, I mean, you go to Chicago and hmm. they're you know finding high crime density areas and then. Yeah putting officers in those places. Yeah. Um, the controversial part is when they send an officer to their heat list, the right. top 500 people, even people who haven't committed crimes yet, but are statistically likely to do so. That gets into some really interesting and thorny places. That was Minority Port, right? Yep. Pre-crime. Yep. There was you go. The so the yeah. algorithms are coming, and <laughs> the robots, overlords, robot overlords will be here any moment. I, um, I'm, I'm prepared to greet them with open arms. And sell them houses. <laughs> sell them houses. There yes. you go. <laughs> uh, uh, the, uh, the opportunities are endless to sell the robot overlords. <laughs> They'll um, need some much to, better to, spread. You know, to, to plug in to recharge. That's right. Well, and re <laughs> recharging stations. Are, is, now you're going to put that stuff into Zillow. I mean, yeah. If there were, if there was, yes. I, I mean, eventually we will put everything that we can find, all forms of data. I mean, school data, for example. We we now have school data on every every home in the country has shows what the schools are that are associated with that property, um, and what the school ratings are, and what their test scores are, et cetera. And that data is coming from the Department of Education? Nope. That, well, again, it's probably originally coming from the Department of Education. We, re we buy it from a reseller, a okay. company called education.com, that we pay a lot of money for that data. Um, 
and I bet you're right. I bet they do get it, get it ultimately from the source, just as the property data resellers get it from the counties and then repackage and sell it to us. I bet they probably get it. This is from an some interesting source. question. So you keep talking about data sources, and we keep coming back to buying and reselling it. Um, would it be a, a, an, a an economic value creation creator for people who are creating jobs, who are entrepreneurs, American tech companies, et cetera, um, if more federal agencies truly opened up their own data? so that people didn't have to buy it? I mean, Absolutely, what, that's okay. no question. What, what I mean, data sets would be useful to you? Oh gosh, um, smog, traffic, um, uh, noise. Mm. Some, a lot of cities actually track noise. Um, uh, zoning, permits, flood data, uh, weather data. Um, I mean, schools and crime are, are obvious uh, as well. Um, uh, m you know, mortgage data. So we, we have we have this. This is a data set that we buy. For example, we know everyone's mortgage amount in the country, not on a name basis, but on a property basis, at least at the time of origination. And we we've chosen here. Here's here's a good example of something we've chosen. We have data in our possession that we've chosen not to put on the website. Um, so uh, you know. It, Another piece of data that we've chosen not to put on the website is the name, property name or pro property owner's name, mm. which we also have on every property in the country. Um, but you don't list that. We don't list that, and so that's that's where we, you know, on the just just on mortgage data for a second. We come back to the name in a moment. On the mortgage data, um, we use that for a lot of analytics. So we produce a lot of research around negative equity, and we compare the zestimate of what we think the home is worth with the mortgage amount on a property by property basis, and then we aggregate it. And we, we make statements like, uh, you know, 20% of all mortgage owners in the U.S. are underwater on their home. Uh, and, you know, 30% of the people in this city and 40% of the people in that city. So, so we use it at the aggregate level. We, we have thus far found it tacky, uh, for lack of a better word, <laughs> to put on a, on a single, you know, properties page what the mortgage amount was at the time of origination. Um, on the name, we've, we have drawn that line on privacy where we are all about telling you everything you could possibly want to know about 123 Main Street, mm. and someday we will get there, all these other data sources that we that, that are knowable about 123 Main Street, but we don't yet have. Um, but the owner name is something that we haven't broached. And, and, you know, when we started the company seven or eight years ago, it was, you know, it was sort of pre-Facebook, pre, um, you know, pre-Twitter, pre-NSA scandals, et cetera. And, and there, there was a higher expectation of personal privacy back then. I mean, it seems quaint, but even five or seven years ago, I think, you know, uh, it, there was a higher expectation of privacy, and, and we were sharing less publicly. I mean, our whole society has shifted, and the government arguably has shifted, and others have, you know, and companies have helped us shift to a much more of an of a open and transparent sharing. When we had the discussion seven years ago around names, for example, whether we should include it at launch, there was no debate in the room. Of course not. We absolutely shouldn't put the name of uh, property owners. We have this discussion every year, literally, we've raised it every year, and every year, well, maybe we should, you know, you can kind of get that data anyway from county records, and, you know, kind of our position sort of has gotten softer, and we still haven't done it, but I do suspect at some point we'll cross that line. The way we sort of skin, the, skin this cat is, um, on most of the listing pages on Zillow, the Home Details pages, we do show a link to the county website. When, and we try to deep link that as deep as possible into the county website. And for some counties, it goes to their homepage, which isn't really all that helpful because they don't actually have separate URLs for each home in their community. But for many, it deep links. And so in King County in Seattle, for example, where I live, um, you can get to the owner name in two seconds. You just link over to the county website, and, and it's on the county website. And so it's not us doing it. It's the county choosing to do it. And that's a that's a decent compromise. So I really should have come to you then and asked you, uh, all, all the homeowners in the country who are Satoshi Nakamoto, right? That, that would have <laughs> we, done it. We can know. know that's just a quick database query. We know the answer to that. Right, next yeah. time I'll see. And for those who aren't familiar, that's the creator of Bitcoin. Um, and Newsweek had a big cover story <laughs> saying they'd founded this person. Now there's now a lot of controversy about whether this is true or not. But it turns out that Zillow might be a... Well, he might be a renter, though. Right. Although with $600 million worth of Bitcoin, he's probably no longer renting. One would think. <laughs> It certainly was an argument against this particular gentleman being that person. Yeah. Uh, but we won't get into that. That's a different panel. Um, so this, this is, a, a, I think, a, a good uh, launch off point for the talking about what's really open and what's not mm -hmm. and who it's valuable to and, and where the um, you know, choke points are in the, in the economy are around this. So you mentioned there's a pretty large uh, existing industry yeah. here. Um, and uh, you are uh, almost kind of rooting around them, through them, underneath them, you know, whatever metaphor we want to use. 
um, uh, and giving people the ability to almost to go direct, yeah. which the internet does rather well often using data like this. Uh, but that also uh, creates uh, the, the kind of the big word in technology right now, disruption. Yeah. And people who are on the other side of disruption do not like it and will use, as you mentioned, uh, uh, the kind of tools they have available. Sometimes that's uh, uh, the media, sometimes that's existing regulations, sometimes it's power and influence in city halls, as you've seen with Uber. Um, what's happening right now around MLS data? Can you explain what that is and sure. how it's a touch point for you all? Well, I, 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 let me just level up for a second and then I'll go into MLS, which is anyone whose business model is predicated on the assumption that their secret data will remain secret and proprietary and they're, they're, that's, that's not a sustainable business model. I mean, the, the, these comp this data will inevitably be free. That's you're, what- You're talking to the federal government here though. Well, okay, <laughs> I, I'm not referring to sort of state secrets, although those two have a tendency inevitably to not become so secret anymore. Yeah. But I mean, if you're a, a company and, and your business model is that you have this secret data, like, I don't know, the, the publisher of the books, the medical books, for example, as that, or, or that is not a business model because the internet is definitely gonna disrupt that. That will inevitably end up online and available, probably free and ad supported, maybe paid, but probably free. So data wants to be free and it will inevitably end up being free. So that's at a high level. Now, MLSs are an interesting animal. So MLSs are multiple listing services. Um, for those less familiar with them, um, there are about 900 of them in the United States. They are, um, each of them are local, typically nonprofit kind of data cooperatives is the easiest way to think about it, where their members are typically the local agents, or sometimes they're called local brokers, but they're the, typically the individual real estate practitioners, the individual agents, typically not the brokerages, typically not the firms, are, are typically not members, typically the individual agents. Um, and um, although sometimes it's the, the brokerages. And the, the, the traditional role of the MLS was data sharing among their members. So when, a, when an agent got a listing, they would, originally it was literally put it in a physical form of card, and every member of the MLS would see all those listings. And it was a way to share listings information and what, what is known as cooperative compensation information. In other words, if you sell my listing for me, I, I, the seller will pay me and I'll pay, I or the seller will pay you. So a way to know who would get paid what. Um, and um, the secondary, secondary role of the MLSs has been to adjudicate disputes among their member agents as sort of a binding arbitration type model for agents in that community. Um, when the internet happened, um, the, the role of the MLS started to, started to change a little bit. And some MLSs, well, and, and agents and brokers started developing websites and some MLSs started powering those websites with this database of listings. And so now today, most members of an MLS can have a website that whose listings are fed by, the, by from the MLS, and then over the last couple of years, the role of the MLS changed even still, where many of these MLSs started viewing part of their role as a member benefit to put listings on sites like Zillow because their members were struggling with how to get the listings to the website, and they didn't necessarily have the ability to do so, but the MLS did have the technology, and so the MLS would do it on the, on behalf of their members. Um, so where does that leave us today? Well, I said, you know, any, any entity whose business model is about sort of protecting data is, is sort of in trouble. Um, the MLSs are not in trouble, though, because what MLSs do is they're basically local associations that advocate on behalf of their member interests and, um, as I say, adjudicate disputes. So it's, it's quite different from the companies that sell us property record data, for example. Um, who, who, who I do think are going to have a challenge in, in the, to their business model in the future. So MLSs are, are safe. To, to think about the healthcare industry for a moment, I guess I would, I would equate it to sort of Zillow is like WebMD or Yahoo Health with all this content and information. Um, the, uh, the, the American Medical Association, which doctors join and pay dues to and lobby on behalf and advance the interests of doctors, is sort of like the National Association of Realtors. Uh, it's a great organization that advocates on behalf of their members, and MLSs or, or associations are sort of offshoots of, of it. And then, of course, you have hospitals and, and, and doctors who are sort of like brokerages and realtors, um, and they don't compete with WebMD. What, what, what has happened, though, is who is a successful doctor in this day and age is changing quite rapidly because of the Internet. I mean, my, my wife is a doctor, okay? She's a pediatrician, and, and every night before she goes to sleep, she, on our home computer, she looks up 
she, she's a, a pediatric rheumatologist, and she looks up her Seattle Children's Hospital intranet to see which patient she's going to see the next day, and she looks up WebMD. And the reason she does it is because she knows that's what the parents of her patients are doing. And in fact, this happens in her office all the time. She'll say to a parent, I think your child has, you know, lupus and we need to give her this drug and parents will pull out their phone and start, you know, Googling lupus and looking it up on Wikipedia and being like, oh, the side effects of that drug, Dr. Raskoff are whatever. And so the role of the doctor is changing and the role of the real estate agent is changing because consumers say all the time to agents, oh, but Zillow says, or the Zestimate says, whatever. And so, um, who, who is going to be, what type of practitioners will be successful in a world with information symmetry rather than the old information asymmetry is, is radically changing. Mm -hmm. But they'll still be doctors, and they'll still be real estate agents, and they'll still they'll still earn fair Will compensation. They'll still be journalists. They're, uh, they're, well, we're all journalists now. Uh oh. So uh, right. So there will still be professional journalists, but there's no question that that business model is changing, you know, right before our very eyes, and you're in the, in the center of that, not not I, but. Oh, it looks like you're a journalist. You're tweeting away. I too. am a journalist. You can yeah. break your own news now. I can, and I do, and um, <laughs> um, uh, it is. I mean, wow, it's. Yeah, now my head is spinning. Yeah, well, let's let's spin some more. Let's yeah. uh, let's push a little bit more into this assertion that if your uh, 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 if your business model is predicated on keeping control, that you're, you're in trouble. Well, I can think off the top of my head: uh, Facebook, a lot of data there; Google, Amazon, Walmart, Netflix. Very different companies, very different industries, sectors, leadership. But uh, in each case, they're keeping a pretty close hold in their data, true, mm -hmm. and uh, driving immense value from it. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, maybe Amazon has a bit of a different profit margin than some of those other companies, and Walmart's different approaches. But they're definitely controlling their own supply chains, their own understanding of who's using their stuff. I mean, think about mm -hmm. the recommendations that Amazon offers, or the search data that Google has and uh, provides mm -hmm. to advertisers. I mean, th this all, it's all about data control, often in, in quite, uh, to use the term of art, closed gardens. Right. And are they? Are they? Are their business models going to go away? No, because uh, the, they're deriving and delivering great consumer benefit f from that data. So, I mean, let's use Google as an example or Amazon as an example. I mean, the, the targeted advertising that you get when you are searching on Google, for example, or the book recommendations that you get on Amazon, um, they benefit you as a consumer. And if they didn't benefit you, then you're, you, you could, the, the switching costs are very low. You could switch to some other, some other search engine or some other place to buy, buy online retail. Um, I also view it as slightly different than kind of resellers of data because they're producing that data. Uh, I mean, it's yeah, it's a walled garden, but they planted the seeds and they cultivated the seedlings. So the difference <laughs> is not so much about um, data that you control or create. It's about data that you're getting from somebody else, repackaging yeah, and extracting I, value I, that I, way. I think you're saying that those, that model. Yes, under, yes, yeah. I, 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 that's right. I mean... I, um, I mean, I don't know. Let's use the stock market as an example. There's tons of data, obviously, on on um, on, on stocks, and Bloomberg has an amazing business model around selling proprietary access to that data. But um, uh, I don't know. I mean, imagine a, imagine if you couldn't check for free the price of a stock. I mean, that's a bit of a mind bender. Uh, we view it as a public good that you ought to be able to, in order for that market to operate efficiently you ought to be able to get real-time prices on stocks. And what's happened as a result of that information transparency, well, commission, trading commissions have come down, uh, liquidity has increased, the market's more efficient, um, capital flows more smoothly, companies get funded and companies don't get funded you know, much more quickly and more efficiently than they used to. And it's all because of you know, easily, readily available access to that data. And... Um, and, you know, the, the Bloomberg paid model is kind of a little bit of a, an anomalous because, I mean, nobody but pays $2,000 a month for a Bloomberg terminal to check the price of, the, of Apple stock real time. They but do it. They, they it do it more than that. Man, that's a deal. Uh, I, I think it's 2000 a month. Maybe, is it 20000 a month? I think it's 20 a month. Okay, sorry, 20 a month. Okay, no one pays 20 a month yeah. uh, for, for a Bloomberg terminal to check the price of a stock. They're doing it to buy, you know, the long tail, the esoteric, you know, futures data and commodities information, stuff that you're not going to find on Yahoo Finance, or if you do, it's going to be delayed on Yahoo Finance. But, but um, when data is readily available and free in, in a particular market, whether it's real estate or stocks, good things happen for consumers. Um, the, I can't think of an example. I mean, the Amazon or other examples that you use are really interesting because you're right. They are examples of companies that are keeping their data to themselves. Um, 
but they're producing it themselves as well. well my, my previous incarnation was a Washington correspondent for O'Reilly Media, so I got to sit you know, and talk with Tim O'Reilly a lot. Right. And you know, they were way out ahead, uh, they, him, but the, yeah. the group of people that are circulating there are, are thinking through uh, the role of data in where the economy is going and where it is right now and seeing how it's used as a control point. Um, but also thinking about you know, some of the other potential for it to be used in much better ways, um, particularly around uh, government releasing it as a backbone, right? For, it basically is public infrastructure. That's somewhat of a controversial idea still in some parts of the world. Uh, but in the U.S., it's, it's almost edging close to gospel, at least in this administration, that uh, public data can be a way for us to better understand our world. Um, in the business sense, though, there's a pretty interesting angle, which is to say if a regulatory agency releases its data about a market that it governs, right. it has an impact upon it. Um, do you see those effects in the market you're in or in other markets if the government releases more data that provides transparency I, to the stock market? No, I, I, it's, I can't. I don't see. I mean, it's hard for me to, uh, to, to think through what bad could happen the good clear that way is the bad from the government releasing lots of housing data. And there's tons of housing data produced by the government um, as well as produced by the private sector, including including Zillow. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think that's terrific. I think that's great. I think it, it creates for, you know, better decisions are made because of all that data. So uh, there's a... There's a uh a blogger up in Canada, um, he's a tech worker, he writes a lot about this space and some of the social justice issues circulated around data. And he's, he's a critic of, of open data, which is a good thing. We need good critics of anything that's about public for policy issue. And he says, uh, if you look at the space, um, you're exposing, say, foreclosures ahead of time, right. right? That you might be exposing then the consumers. And is, is the idea behind releasing the government data that, um, that that kind of thing should be right in the market right away, or should they have an opportunity you know, to somehow defend themselves? Is, is exposing that kind of, of economic circumstance a good outcome? It's a great question, and something that we, we struggled a lot with, because we made that decision. So we're the only website that posts about a million foreclosure listings and about a million pre-foreclosure listings for free. This data has been available typically behind a paywall on sites like RealtyTrack or Foreclosure.com. Available to the inside insiders in the industry? Uh, no, to consumers, to consumers who pay $50 pay. a month. So actually what we did for the first five years of the company's history was we had a business development deal where Foreclosure.com sent us a feed of these listings, foreclosure and pre-foreclosure listings. And you would see sort of teaser information on Zillow and you'd click over to Foreclosure.com and have to pay $50 a month in order to see all the information. We made a lot of money from that partnership. We drove them a lot of traffic and we got paid handsomely for it. Um, and about two years ago, we decided um, to end that relationship to buy all that data, because by the way, where are they getting all that data from? They're buying it from the government and from ser loan servicers and from other people. And um, we decided to go upstream from them, buy all that data ourselves and make it available for free to consumers. Um, and so, it is there for free on Zillow right now um, to, to see all this data. It's the blue, the blue homes are the, the off-market inventory, um, and it's, it, it shows, it shows uh, pre-foreclosure listings, for example, and then the red homes are, are foreclosure listings. And we thought a lot about the privacy implications and the, the moral implications of seeing that 123 Main Street is behind on their loan, and they've been sent a, you know, a notice of, of, um, of, of a foreclosure resale and other, you know, all the, there's a series of sort of nasty grams that you get from your lender along the way, and we list them all. Uh, and at some point, that nasty gram goes from you know being really bad to really really bad, and that's when you know that's when you lose your house. And so you know on on listings now we we list it at the property level. This is another reason why we don't put names. Um, and ultimately, when we had this debate around you know do the pros outweigh the cons of this, um, we decided that. It's valuable information to the efficient functioning of that local marketplace that a buyer in, in that community looking at listings there, they have their right to know that there's a house on their street which is going to materially impact the value of an asset that they're considering purchasing. That is a, that is a significant uh, benefit to that buyer. And, and also to that buyer, we know that that's latent inventory that's probably going to come on the market. And what actually ends up happening quite a bit is the buyer's agent approaches that pre-foreclosure listing, the person that's behind on their mortgage, and says, hey, let's, uh, we will, let's stop this foreclosure from happening. 
and the home gets sold actually before it becomes a foreclosure, which is a benefit to the buyer, the buyer's agent, and to the distressed homeowner. Um, and you know, we hoped that that would happen. We weren't sure if it would. It is happening, and so we decided that that benefit also outweighed the the cons. Um, but it, but it is it is up for debate. I mean, don't think we didn't debate it. We certainly did. There's a business benefit, of course, which is we like that we're the only website with these listings, and it certainly generates additional traffic that we that we monetize. Um, but we but we also debated intensely the the moral and and um, other issues around this. Um, so looking towards the future a little bit. Uh, one of the things that uh, happened in D.C. this month was a big forum on the release of more climate data. Uh, administrations getting together with NASA, Commerce Department, that are all talking about releasing more of it uh, in a way that they hope will help local communities understand um, where the risks are coming from. That's great. And increase the resilience. You know, uh, there and uh, you know this is something that theoretically could be of use to all of humanity. Right? We've got. We're the ones that put all the satellites up. We're the ones contributing the images from them. We're giving Google huge amounts of data for them to put into their Earth engine, which is an amazing thing if you haven't gone and looked at it. And um, it struck me as I was thinking about this forum uh, that uh, understanding the potential risks from climate change would be of interest to someone buying a house totally. uh, in a lot of places. Yep. Uh, so to what extent are you integrating that kind of data already into your models and the homes? Um, what utility would it be if more of it comes in? Um, and is there, you know, the prospect of a score from these things I mean, <coughs> that uh, people will be able to see, you know, using that? Uh, it's a great example of, of data that's out there that we haven't integrated yet into the product. I mean, it would make its way into the product in a very indirect way to the extent that um, we start to see in the data an impact on home sales and home prices and asking prices and you know et cetera and tax assessments. So, you know, for example, um, you know, New Orleans home values obviously had a, a difficult rebound after Katrina. But in terms of you know, on a, in a predictive basis using climate data, we don't do it yet. I'd love to. It's fascinating. It's a great example of some of the good that can come from from the release of this type of data. Um, I mean, what I'd love to do is develop more ways where we can eat our own cooking and we can allow others to integrate on top of Zillow. I mean, you can imagine, like this is an example of something that's below our cut line. We haven't gotten to it yet, mm. but why should we be the ones that have to get to it? Why can't somebody else mash up Zillow and this weather data? Um, and, uh, you know, here it gets complicated and sort of interesting and you sort of business, you have sort of business model questions, et cetera. But, um, yeah, if there's if there's data out there associated with with the home, we want it, and um, you know, and occasionally we'll draw the line and we'll get it, and then we won't use it. Uh, but but we think that it's a value to the user. Can you think of other categories of data that you would not use? Um, so just to, from your uh, your dream sure, federal yeah. open data sets, I've yeah. got a list right here of the stuff you want. Uh, I think we wouldn't use how many kids live in a house, for example. That's data that the Census Bureau has, and if we had it on a property level, we wouldn't we wouldn't publish. How about it. how many cats? I don't like cats very much, so I'd be okay so, publishing that. So cats that. would go in? Yeah, but dogs, I think dogs. I like dogs. Um, so X yeah. number of dogs, but 30 <laughs> cats, that's a warning. Well, you wouldn't want to live next to someone with 30 cats, so maybe that is relevant data. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I don't know. I mean, um, you know, child safety issues are, are a big one. But, I mean, for example, a lot of counties now make available um, sex, um, sex, you know, child, you know, molester maps or whatever. Um, and that's not data that we've incorporated yet. We probably ought to. Um, we probably will at some point. Um, that's, a, that's a really good place to jump off, actually. Um, you know, the other countries are moving forward with sharing some of these kinds of data. Um, uh, Scandinavia, I believe specifically Sweden, not 100% sure. Uh, if people can Google things here, I suppose I could too. Um, that they're putting up a registry of all the, the crime. Right. And, uh, but once you localize that to a specific place, it completely changes someone's life. It does, yeah. And, uh, you know, here you say if someone served their time, that 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 so that's they've served their time and then that's it. You yeah. Know, if so, you, but but if you put that into Zillow, that's it. For them, I think right? I mean, I, so. That is a. I struggle with that. I guess I would just push that issue upstream to the legislators that decide what if it's if it has been decided that it should be made publicly available. I want it on Zillow. <laughs> um, okay. You know, I so wouldn't. You leave it to the deliverative bodies yeah, to make the call. Yeah. And 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 that's an excellent point. And I, I we've had this discussion actually. And I'm not sure how I would. Feel because I do. I do. On, I'm very sympathetic to the point that you're making, which is if society has said that you've served your time, then why should my, you know, why should I continue to sort of serve time in a different way? Yep. 
but that's not for me to decide. Um, okay. Well, um, uh, I mean, other, a, but I, I mean, I, I guess I don't know. Uh, interior photos of a house is another good example. So when you, when your house gets listed on Zillow and your agent posts the, the pictures on Zillow, um, they're there. And then um, when the home goes off market, what do we do with the pictures of the house? Right. Who owns those photos, first of all? Does the seller own it? Does the listing broker own it? Does the MLS own it? Does Zillow own it? Does the new buyer own it? It's actually very unclear. It's not even clear to us who owns those pictures at that point. Um, uh, what we do do, though, is if the new... Well, usually we take the photos down. Um, it depends on some circumstances. But um, but regardless, if the owner asks us to take them down, we, if they're still there, we take them down. Um, and that's an, you know there are some cases where we actually don't ha shouldn't have to we don't have to because the the new owner doesn't own the those photos perhaps we do but we've drawn the line there uh, you know when if you if if an owner emails us and says hey there are pictures of my of my six year old daughter's my my new house where my six year old daughter just moved in this bedroom um, and that creeps me out we take it down mm -hmm. um, so there you know there's another example. Uh, there are a lot of attitudes around many different things that government collects data about and the, how public they should be. Uh, one of the, the most uh, poignant or maybe politicized examples, I should say, it's not exactly poignant, uh, came uh, recently when a newspaper put uh, uh, a map up of uh, who had a handgun license in a particular area. Right. Now, they, they, um, they made a different call than you did right. um, by putting names and addresses into it. Instead of using the heat map, they actually localized it. But that was public data. Yeah. Now, I can imagine consumers in one part of the country wanting to know which of their neighbors have guns. I can imagine in other parts of the country where you could get in a lot of trouble from doing that in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, as a company, you know, it's a question. Now, that's public data. Yeah. At least it was. The New York State Legislature changed the law, actually, to, the, to your point right. around making it useful. Yeah. But if that's public data, would you put it on there? Um, we haven't discussed that. Um, <laughs> so that, so I'm, this, is, this is real time iterating here. Um, I think if the legislator, legislature had decided that that, was, that that should be available online on their site, then yes, we would put that on okay. our site. Um, what about whether there, uh, the certain percentage of homeowners had uh, uh, licensed the um, land underneath of them for fracking, for allow allowing that to happen? Definitely. Definitely. So Absolutely. Definitely. So if, the, so if yeah. New York State released that, Pennsylvania released that, Absolutely. integrated in there. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. environmental stuff. <laughs> done and done. You're, you're, you're teasing out all my, like sort of what I, you know, you know, now you know I don't like cats. Care a lot about the environment. I'm kind of well. See, this yeah. you can do big data. You can do an interview, one or the other. Uh, you can analyze your Twitter stream over time. Well, look, um, I mean, this this stuff is supposed to be a little uncomfortable. That's the whole point of these right. forums. The point of these discussions. It's a, it's the reason not to say that open data is a perfect panacea. That open government means everything right. should be transparent. Yeah. Well, political donations threats. are another one, right? Yeah. And political donations are tracked by by address. Yeah. Um, we can put what you know. The person who lives at this house gave this much money to the. But you, you know, don't. We we don't. I'd like to. We ought to. Yeah, I would do that. That's interesting. I would do that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And again, th th that's something that. You know, th that the legislature, legislators, legislatures have decided should be publicly available. Uh, I don't think it presents a public safety issue. Um, it, it you know is it relevant to my decision to move into this neighborhood or buy this home? Yeah, kind of debatable. Maybe I really don't want to live next to. A particular type of person, I think that's kind of iffy, but um, but it's interesting. There, there, it's probably not. Ad, it's not like the foreclosure example where I do I do think that's advancing my ability to make an informed decision about this real estate transaction. Here, it's a little bit voyeuristic. It's a little it's bit about the rest of the world. It doesn't directly contribute in the same way. Yeah, this one I think is is maybe just I don't know. It's interesting from a voyeuristic standpoint. I think to a Zillow user, but it's not necessarily making the real estate market more efficient. Yep. Um, uh, one thing that would be of interest to me right now is, uh, uh, you know, cell phone coverage and broadband oh. yep. service. Here in, in uh, Capitol Hill, this is an issue. I pretty much can do Comcast, or I can use yep. various wireless providers. So uh, we, we, we do a, a, a version of that. We pull in um, from the cell companies and, um, and the cable companies what the local costs are, huh. um, and we put that on, on the listing pages. Your speed? We for a, we've done some ad deals with with FiOS and a couple others where if the home you know if that home passes through FiOS then it says it on the, the listing page, but we don't have a it's not nationwide it's kind of an ad deal basically. The FCC yeah. made a big fuss about its national broadband map a couple of years ago. Great. Open data, open source, online, but you're not using the stuff. You're giving us you got got a whole list now of things we got to go back and build. <laughs> These are great ideas, um, and um, we don't have that. I'd love to.
Okay. Do you know, a, you know, but 50 not, good software not developers that we can hire so we can get uh, all this stuff shipped. I mean, this is the challenge for a, for a technology company like Zillow is, is, is these are the types of ideas that end up kind of below the cut line when you sit in prioritization meetings of what should we work on over the next three months because it's just really hard. No one of them really moves the needle in a, in a big way, but in the aggregate, they make a web service like Zillow much more useful. Um, but it's just always hard to prioritize any one of them. So the bottom line <laughs> is more open data makes your service more useful. Absolutely. That, that's the connection we're drawing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Take that, you can take that away from this forum. That, Absolutely. That's something useful. So uh, speaking yeah. of which, uh, I did say I'd take uh, questions to Tim. So if anyone has a question, put up the old hand and I'll ask it. Okay? Right there. Going back to the MLS, though, uh, you know, realizing that different uh, uh, brokerages or agencies have their own uh, providers in their front end, the, the search stuff, by and large, regardless of whether it's a, a high-end brokerage or not, is generally crap. Um, why is that, and is that a business opportunity for you to, to basically sell yeah. Well, and it's even worse on mobile. Um, and, and the reason is because these are not technology companies. They're real estate brokerages. Right, but they're not even getting good vendors. Uh, that's true. And um, that's, that is our opportunity. So we bought one. We bought one called Diverse Solutions, which was the best of the bad bunch that made websites for real estate agents. And what did we do? We made them free. So we now give away websites that look great on the desktop and great on mobile to real estate agents that the, our 50,000 advertising premier agents all get a free website. And many tens of thousands of them now have good websites in, 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 in all different MLSs where the, the listings come from the MLS. And if you find one of them in the community that you're looking at that comes from, from us, then it, it'll be good. Uh, it probably still won't be as good as Zillow because of all these data things that we're talking about. Because at its core, it just has the MLS listings. It doesn't have the foreclosure listings and pre-foreclosure listings, for sale by owner listings and new construction listings and Zestimates and all the other stuff that we've been talking about. But at least it's a usable website, <laughs> which is more than you can say for most brokerage sites. So to follow on to that, the, the, the other thing that, that, that whether it's a, a Zillow or an MLS or a whole lot of other things in the, in the sales and advertising uh, auction type marketplace rather mm -hmm. than a retail marketplace, there's not there's not a really good solution for I'm looking for let me know when that shows it's, up kind of thing. That's true. I mean, you can create safe search notifications on sites like Zillow and you'll yeah. get emails. But um, what, what um, uh, you, you're right, I, I agree. And we're working on it. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, um, you're right. Amazon has led the way in that regard around personalization and recommendations and there's a lot of the ball will get moved forward here, especially on mobile. I mean, you can imagine push notifications, for example. Um, I mean, this is already happening, and this relates to data, I guess. So, so on Google, on Android phones, Google has something called Google Now on Android phones that push content that Android, your Android phone thinks you would find interesting to the start screen of your phone. So it actually reads your email, it looks at your Google Calendar, it looks at your search history, and if it sees that you have a flight this afternoon to LA, it'll push flight status information to the start screen of your phone. If it sees that um, you know you were querying for a dinner reservation, it'll push availability from OpenTable to the start screen of your phone. And Google now, if it sees that you're interested in real estate, because it reads your Gmail, it looks at your calendar, it looks at your search activity, whatever, it pushes real estate listings that Google thinks would be interesting from Zillow to the start screen of your phone, of your Android phone. So we, we're the ones that provide those listings for Google and the personalization on Android phones without you even, you may not even know who Zillow is and you're gonna start seeing listings on your Android phone. And that hasn't populated over the, 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 the iPhone? Uh, no, it has with push notifications. If you have the Zillow app, then we, we give you notifications. But no, Apple does not have a competing Android Now or Google Now product, but they're rumored to be working on something like this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Great. Awesome. <laughs> we can talk after. <laughs> choose, choose the best one. <laughs>
the Facebook group. Yeah. Yeah. Softball yeah, this to is, softball here. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, this is a really very controversial topic in our industry. This is yeah. off market listings, yeah. and and um, there are a lot of MLSs, like the Northwest MLS in Seattle, for example, forbids off market listing transactions. I mean, you can get big, big trouble if you do that. So they've taken a very serious stance. MRIS here is trying to figure out what sort of what to do about it. Is this a problem or not? Um, I don't know. I'm not. I, I mean, the con the consumer advocate in me says, you know. Whatever, man. You know, <laughs> it's more, more, you know, more information, more transparency. You know, that that's that's okay. It's sort of like, um, you know, a lot of stock market trends. A lot of stock market transactions occur on the Nasdaq or the NYSE, but there are also a lot of other private exchanges where you can buy and sell stocks through other exchanges, and that's okay too. And buyers and sellers gravitate to whichever exchanges are the biggest, and sometimes they also participate in two. And um, I don't know that part of me says sort of so what? Like this is this is okay. Um, the other part of me is kind of concerned about fragmentation of these marketplaces because you have a huge benefit of you being able to sort of look in one place and see all the listings you're so I, the, the truth is, you, I'm sure you you have spent much more time and are more expert on this than I am. I don't I don't know what my opinion is about the, these off market transactions. Um, I don't know. Other questions. Yeah. On the other hand, is that a competitive advantage in order to put up with talking to ten different data sources? So, so you're right. Manhattan is the only major city in the country without an MLS, and that's why a company called Street Easy became so dominant in Manhattan as the consumer-facing website, and that's why we acquired it. So we paid $50 million to buy Street Easy in August, mm -hmm. and it is by far the largest real estate site in New York. I mean, like head and shoulders bigger than anyone else. And agents in New York, brokers in New York, basically use it like the MLS. They upload their listings to Street Easy, and if your listing is on Street Easy, then it is in the marketplace. It's like when you take a listing here and you put it in MRIS, it is the marketplace because it puts it on all the agent and broker websites. It syndicates to Zillow, etc. That's the the role that Street Easy plays in in Manhattan. Um, uh, and I just one note about Street Easy: they use Open Street, uh, op Open. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. OpenStreetMap. Map. Yeah. I couldn't get it out right. And if you don't know about OpenStreetMap, it's like the Wikipedia for maps. Yep. And all the data on there is open data. Yep. That's a startup that came out of New York City that sold 50 million bucks based upon open data. Just wanted to throw that into the mix. It's true. It's true. Um, so uh, you know, New York, like all things, is, is a very unique market, especially in the real estate market, as it sounds like you, you are probably on the front lines of. Um, yeah, I mean, New York, New York is odd. I grew up in New York, and my mom was a realtor as when I was a kid, so I'm, I'm very, very familiar with the New York real estate market. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's unique for not having an MLS, but it has this kind of pseudo-MLS in, in the form of Street Easy. So, it, but it is different than everywhere else. Okay. How about Or when diseases are going to spread, I think you can use like yeah. Google Query data to. Yeah. yeah. Um, not enough. Uh, I mean, this today has actually been really interesting for me to think about all, all these other. I thought we were a data-intensive company. Apparently, we've just scratched the surface. Is what I've learned. Um, uh, I, we do get asked all the time, almost every time I go to New York and meet with financial institutions, investors, hedge funds, whatever, we get asked all the time, can we buy this packet of data? You know, can we buy this? Can we that? And, and um, we've never sold data. In fact, when Street Easy, just as an example, was $10 a month when we bought it and we made it free. And we made it free because we want all the data to be free. Like we don't, it's crazy to charge for data. It should be free. It's a public good here. Um, so yeah, if the, if the government came to us, for example, and said, hey, we want to analyze whatever, you know, mortgage trends or migration trends or, or <coughs> et cetera, uh, we'd be, Thrilled, and we have collaborated. Actually, um, our chief economist has testified before, uh, you know, some congressional committees, and we've collaborated with the Fed and HUD and Fannie and Freddie on a bunch of things. Um, they're not using our data in any systematic way, on kind of a recurring basis, but but our data makes its way into a lot of their work. Um, and I would love it if if that you know if if we took that a step further.
<laughs> yeah. Have, have you ever heard the expression, don't, don't bite the hand that feeds you? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, you can imagine a lot of great ways to let counties, for example, upload data to a central shared nonprofit, whatever, and, you know, and, and we, that we sponsor, whatever, but it's, you know, it's tricky. I mean, I, what I'm describing, I'm describing like an end state. It might take 50 years to get there and I need to operate a website for the next 49 of them. So, um, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> I don't, I don't, and, and so it's why I would sort of use the WebMD analogy. Like, real estate agents are always gonna be here, they're always gonna earn big commissions, and they always are gonna play a really critical role in the transaction, and I'm fine with that. I'm pleased about that. In fact, if real estate agents make more money, they'll buy more advertising. So I root for real estate agents, and probably the biggest misnomer is that we have some master plan to put agents out of commission or out of business or lower their commission or you know disintermediate them and that's not true at all. Um, what is happening for sure is the role of the realtor is changing. The role of the real estate agent is changing. Who is going to be a successful agent is changing. My mom, when I was a kid, was a realtor. She would you know she'd get her lunch eaten today, right? I mean she was like a typical real estate agent of the 80s that did a couple of deals a year kind of casually part-time through her friends and sphere of influence. I mean, today, you need to be web savvy. You need to have some sort of a software system. You need to work 24-7 or be part of an agent team. You need to be ready for a consumer who is going to pull up public record data and, you know, be smarter or, or at least more informed or as informed as you. Maybe not smarter, but as informed as you, just like a patient and a doctor. So that has radically changed, um, uh, partly because of, of Zillow, but, but also because of the Internet in general. Um, so... I get called, when I speak at business schools, for example, I get called kind of a cop-out or a sell-out sometimes because they're usually like, well, you put the agents out of business and they earn this 6%, it's so high, and you know, you're a wimp for not you know, disintermediating them. It should just be like stock trading. And I'm always like, this is a, partic a particular problem at Harvard Business School, by the way. Um, and I'm always like, how many of you, you know, bright whippersnappers that think you're the king of the world, how many of you ever actually bought a house? And like, nobody. Okay. <laughs> Maybe one guy, one international student is usually like, well, I sold my condo in Madrid before I came to HBS or whatever, right? And I'm like, that doesn't count. Um, and I'm like, well, <laughs> the truth is when a firefighter and a school teacher, husband, wife in, you know, Cincinnati sell their $150,000 house, it is too infrequent, it's expensive, it's complex, it's too important to screw up. And they're more than happy to pay three or $5,000 commission to a, a real estate agent to make sure they don't screw it up. And... Um, the other, the other constituency besides business school students that really misses this is actually Wall Street because investment bankers and private equity investors and hedge funds, they also have this you know, feeling that real estate agents are a dinosaur or whatever. And then I say, you know, why do you think M&A investment, investment bankers sell, make like 2 or 3% when they sell a company or 6 or 7% when they take a company public? And it's because they earn their fee. They, they I mean, very, very quick story, probably running a short time, but... I was, I was a Goldman M&A banker, okay? And my co-founder at Hotwire was also a Goldman M&A banker. And when we sold the company four years later, we hired Goldman Sachs to sell the company. And we knew exactly what they were gonna do. We had done it before, right? We knew they were gonna write a book and they were gonna, here's how they were gonna negotiate it and they were gonna you know, go to these bidders and run this type of process, et cetera. And we paid them a huge fee, tens of millions of dollars to sell the company for $700 million. And you know, on one hand, it was crazy. Why on earth would you pay these people all this, this massive amount of money to do that? On the other hand, I'm 100% confident that they earn their fee. They got more than $1 more than their commission, than their fee. And that's how most people feel about their real estate agent. They may regret the size of the commission, but when they really think about, could I have done it better myself and, and made that difference up, they probably couldn't have. All right, so. time for one more question, if it's out there. Yeah, it doesn't have to be perfect, and and this is the thing. I mean, I, I see a lot of this innovation at a really local level because, as I, as I mentioned, I hear this a lot from local governments. They're like, oh, you know, I, I'd love to put my crime data on, but we don't know how to do that or whatever. Just put it up on the web. If it's interesting enough data, somebody will hack it and turn it into something better. Like, it doesn't have to be perfect. 
It can be up there. Literally just put like a PDF of, you know, here's the police blotter for the last, last week. And somebody will turn it into, into readable, machine readable format data and it will get used for something. Usually useful to convene people around doing that. That's been the experience. Yeah, that's state, true. Local you level, have a right? little meeting and you get hackers right. together and then Let they do it. So they need to become aware of it. But yeah. there are a lot of organizations now that help raise, aware, including this one, that help raise awareness of, of, of the existence of this data. So it, I, I, I think it's a mistake. I don't, I, I don't like when, I don't want governments or others to sort of hide behind that. Like it's complex and expensive. Like just do whatever you can and I think it, it'll, get, it'll get used. Yeah. Well, thank thank you for that. It's a it's a really good question. Um, I I know that uh, people at the GSA and OSTP and other agencies are really struggling with this. There's an RFI out right now from Department of Commerce about releasing more data. Uh, if you're uh, not aware of this, the volume of data coming out for the National o Oceanic Administration, uh, Atmospheric Administration. I think I got that right. Uh, NOAA. Um, it, they put out something like two terabytes a day, but they collect twenty. So how do they get that out? How much more value could be unlocked by having that much more information about the world? Now, there's huge amounts of other regulatory data, of other agency data as well, but there's this you know, question, if Congress doesn't fund that, how do you actually then release it? And if it's dirty, you know, who will bear the, the, um, the brunt of doing the processing, of doing the hosting for it? Because that actually does cost something. Um, you know, some of the agencies are really good at this. The US Census Bureau, Awesome, they they get it and they're releasing well, their stuff. They, and they you view it, it as right? part of their mantra. I think yeah. they view it as the, the reason they collect all this data is to release it, and it's been like that since the Constitution was created the Census Bureau. So it's in their DNA. Uh, That's but why NASA's good too. They're scientific yeah. organizations. But NOAA, they, release they don't exist to get the data and release it. They exist to get the data and study it. I think, and so they may have to change the way they think about what role do they play. Mm -hmm in the country or the world. Well, they, I, I think in talking to Census Bureau employees, it seems like they view their job as to be stewards of the data right. and then release it to the country to understand. Right. Not all agencies necessarily have that perspective. And I should say, not all members of Congress do or the congressional technology bodies do as well. There's a lot of wrangling around congressional bulk legislative data with the same kinds of issues. Right. Um, and there are concerns that you know if you release the data, and it's not clean, well then people will misunderstand it. Or if it is clean, they'll cherry pick it. And one side of the, you know, will make it one argument, one side will make the other. I mean, these are, these are really hard yeah. discussions um, and they come up a lot. But uh, you've given us a whole hour and then thank some. You. So thank you for that. Thank you ever for the great questions. Um, he is at, uh, let's see, uh, Spencer Raskoff, did I get that right? <laughs> On Twitter and does actually spend time there, I know, because you go back and forth. Um, at Digifile, uh, please follow up if you have more questions. Thanks to the Internet Caucus. Please come back to another one of these.